Hello friends, let's just rip the bandaid off. I'm stopping doing monthly wrap ups. I haven't done any for the past few months, you may have noticed, and I just wasn't enjoying doing them anymore. <laughs> I find because I read pretty much every single book in a vlog, either on my channel or on my Patreon, I can't remember the last time I read a book that was not in a vlog. The monthly wrap ups just weren't the most interesting for me to make. I wasn't finding it exciting anymore, and I have so many video ideas that having one slot taken up every single month out of like eight to 10 videos that you're not excited for, it just didn't make sense. So we're stopping doing monthly wrap-ups, but I am starting to do quarterly wrap-ups because they excite me. I feel like with quarterly wrap-ups, A, with my reading statistics, I will have a much bigger sample size to say something. I was starting to feel like in the monthly wrap-ups, I was just like saying the stats, like meh. Whereas I feel like <laughs> with a quarterly wrap-up sample, you have more to kind of say and extrapolate on and have opinions on. One month of reading is quite a small sample and also the format we're going to have inspired by some other booktubers i think books and lala does something very similar to this we're going to go through our five worst and five best so that's what the quarterly wrap-ups are going to be stats then five best and five worst and i think this really will just help us look at the highs and lows i'm really excited there may be something their monthly wrap-ups may be coming in a different format somewhere i'll let you know if i do end up doing that i do have some ideas for how i would like to kind of memorialize monthly wrap-ups but i'm not 100 percent sure but yeah shall we we just get into my quarterly wrap up for the second quarter of the year and see what my reading stats were and see what the best and worst books of the months were. Why did my voice go so high? <laughs> Anyways, let's just get into it. Okie dokie, let's talk through the reading stats. I'm very excited to see these and see what my reading has been like over the past couple months. Bear in mind, <laughs> May and June were rough months. Rough months. Rough. <laughs> rough months for me personally. So, um... Let's just get into it, shall we? So in this quarter, I read 37 books. 37 books, I think is pretty good. That's like an average of, what, 12 per month? Basically 12 per month. I would say usually I read about 12 books per month. I'd say 10 to 15. So that checks out <laughs> as kind of my average books per month. Pages read, I like doing this monthly because it sounds so impressive. I have like 12,262 pages. You're that girl, I knew you were. It probably isn't that many. Sometimes I've seen booktubers who read like 10,000 pages in a single month. Sorry, that can't be me. I don't think that'll ever be me. I don't, I'm not like a speedy, speedy, speedy reader. Some of these bitches out here are <laughs> fucking <laughs> reading faster than a speed of light. I'm like, how do you guys have a life? Honestly, I admire you so much. Um, But I feel impressed by myself of 12,000 in one month. <laughs> But that averages out to an average of 135 pages per day, which I think is usually what it comes down to roughly. And an average pages per book of 331. And considering I know there's some like short story slash novella situations in that, it's, it means I read some long ones. I read some long boys in the month too. My average rating. Remember bearing in mind I want my average rating to be a, is it a 3.8? I want my average rating to be or higher. Yes, very much I want my average rating to be a 3.8 or higher. My average rating was a 3.5. Listen, life we're life in. Life was life in. And I also just had a few videos where I read some trash books. The cat, all the cat books on my TBR was particularly probably the worst. The worst vlog I've had in a long time. I like really did not enjoy, did I enjoy any of those really? I think nothing was above a 3.5 in that video and I read like five books and it was all about cat. I'm really talk about it. It's very disappointing. <laughs> Very disappointing. Yeah, 3.5 is not great. What is my average rating for the, I will tell you it for the year so far at the moment. It's not much better, it's 3.6. Ah! 316. We've really got to bring that up. We've really, and the thing is, the vlog I'm doing at the moment. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> Cut the cameras. Dead end. It's not. I don't think it's going to be much better. That is really not going that well, is it? Me trying to get my average rating up. I just want to read more five stars. I want to read more amazing books. I just want to read more amazing books. I'm excited for the vlog I've got coming after my current one though. So we'll see. Um, and the average time a book had spent on my TBR was 13.75 months. I read some books on my TBR that had been on my TBR for a really, really long time this month. Like there was a lot of TBR veterans. There's a lot of ones for Wrapped Up Retro. We have My Dark Vanessa, we have Into the Drowning Deep. We have uh, Firekeeper's Daughter, The Obelisk Gate. What else? Shine, Essex Girls, Pride and Premeditation, Pride and Prejudice were all on my TBR for over 30 months. 
So we had a few that had been on here for a very, very long time, which is always a good thing. You know, I want my TBR to feel fresh. That's why I did Wrapped Up Retro. So I want to start reading, you know, those books that had been on my TBR for a really long time. I really want to like, if I could get my TBR, what is the oldest book on my TBR? Let me, let me, let me look at this quickly. I want to know like where I would like to get the cutoff points. Let me go on my own shelf. The oldest books on my TBR are ones that were added in 2018. 2019. These are the oldest, right? I would like to get all of these read. I mean, how good would that feel if I got all of these read? If I could get up to like mid, oh, could I get everything from 20? My mouse just died. Oh, everything's going wrong. <laughs> if I could get these first two pages read, which basically takes us up to everything in 2020, I would love that. If it was only stuff that had been on my TBR since 2021, I think the next page will basically be stuff. There'll be maybe a few. Oh no, it is. So don't have to read these. Some of these are still on, on Wrapped Up Retro because they're still within the 50 oldest books on my TBR. But if I could get like these first two pages of books read and off my TBR, that would feel so good. That would feel so good. Oh my God, Veronica Speedwell's on there. That's kind of crazy. That's kind of crazy. Um, but there's a few of these that I'm reading soon. So I'm actually feeling okay about that that goal. That would be really good if I could get those oldest books on my TBR because then I think it will just feel fresher. The shortest book I read this quarter was Unhinged at 65 pages and the longest book I read this quarter was Reach for the Stars with 520 pages. We're actually going to be speaking about both of those later. Let's get into the charts. Okay, my genre, the thing with genre is it looks even more like uh, like there's even more variation because like there's a lot of genres I've read one of <laughs> and it's more exacerbated across the three month sample. So I read one classic. I'm really surprised. I read six contemporary. I don't think of myself really as someone who reads a lot of contemporary anymore, but I just happened to read quite a lot this, this past quarter, which is interesting. Five fantasy, one historical, four horror, one magical realism, one memoir, seven mystery is my, yeah, that's my biggest genre, not a surprise. Two nonfiction. I read three romance, two sci-fi, and four thriller. So that's, listen, is there any genre there that I did not read from in the past quarter that I would usually? No. <laughs> I hit all of the, I hit every genre. There's nothing on, I didn't read a graphic novel, but all of my other shelves on my bookshelf are represented there. <laughs> so I read a little bit of everything this quarter, which I like. In terms of format, it's not interesting. I read 32 novels <laughs> and I read two anthologies, two novellas and one short story. I do read majority novels. I don't think I have any graphic novels on my TV, apart from one, one, that rusty brown one that you would have seen on that old ass books list. Cause that's one my dad got me. I don't know what it is, it's about a man. It's fucking huge and it's a graphic novel. Other than that, I don't think I have any graphic novels on my TBR unless I'm forgetting anything because I read graphic novels as soon as I get them. And I don't buy them that often because I'm not super in the graphic novel world. But as soon as they're on my TBR, I read them. <laughs> and I found myself wanting some graphic novels lately. So if anyone has any graphic novel recommendations for me, please let me know. I might dive into some of K. O'Neill's stuff, the author of the Tea Dragon Society, because they've done loads of other books. So I might get some of those. Um, but yeah, I need more graphic novel recommendations. In terms of source read, I read one as an ebook, which was unhinged. <laughs> And I read 19 physically and seven with the audiobook and physical. I think at the start of the year, I was reading a lot more mixture. I was relying on the audiobook a lot, lot. Like I could, I think for the past two, first two months of the year, I couldn't really read without an audiobook. <laughs> My focus wasn't great. Whereas this quarter, I've read a lot just physically. And yeah, I'm feeling like I've gotten used to reading physically again. For a second there, <laughs> I thought I'd need the audiobook for every book I ever read. How many people were scared? Me too. I was really, really scared. I've been enjoying, there's certain authors I think work best just physically. I don't like romance. I, I like class, like I Pride and Prejudice I listen to the audiobook for, but like contemporary romance, I don't think I can listen to the audiobooks because it just is cringe. Some of those lines in those things, it's a bit cringe if someone says them. If they're unsaid, it's fine, you know, but like hearing someone say that, ee! you know, a little bit ick, a little bit of an ick. <laughs> or there's just certain authors like Catherine Arden. I read The Warm Hands of Ghosts, which we'll talk about in a bit. You know, I just like reading her in my head. There's certain authors whose cadence I like reading in my head. So I'm glad that I got off of my audiobook, you know, what's the word, addiction? No, my audiobook dependency. 
<laughs> bit this quarter. In terms of author status, I read 14 debut, 11 that were new to me, and 12 that I had read from before. So pretty much a third <laughs> of each, almost. I would like read from before to be more of 50%. In the months when I noticed that my average rating is a lot higher, is because I'm reading from authors that I know and love, that I've read from before, that I know I enjoy. And I think if I want a higher rating, I do need to maybe next quarter try and switch that to like 50% authors I read from before, 50% debut and new to me because it's just some a correlation that I notice in my reading. In terms of where I acquired the books from, 17 were books I'd bought, 15 were books I've been gifted, four were from the publisher and one was from book of the month. So I think that's usually there's a bit more variation in that, but just predominantly books I've been bought or books I've been gifted. I've been gifted a lot of books lately, as you guys know. Um, could you buy it? Because I don't want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna talk more about uh, life stuff in the next video. I don't want to like repeat myself, but um, you guys have been very kind. You guys have been very kind and gifted me a lot of books. So I think that's why that stat looks higher because I've maybe been reading some that have come on my TBR. Uh, in terms of audience, I read 32 adult books and five YA. I feel like that's a little bit more than I had been. Well, we had, I think, in the start of the year, quite a few months where I only read adult. <laughs> I didn't read anything else. So I read some YA. What was the YA I read this month? Because I want wonder what ratings I was giving it. So I read Pride and Premeditation, which I gave a 3.5. I read A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking, which I gave a 4. Oh, I read Shine. <laughs> Talk about that, I gave that one star. Uh, I read Firekeeper's Daughter, which I gave a 3.5. And I read Throwback by Maureen Goo, which I gave a 4. So nothing that was like a favourite, but not terrible. <laughs> Not terrible in terms of average rating. In terms of series stats, I read 21 standalones, 10 that were first in the series, but most of those I am not continuing the series. <laughs> I think I've only got four series I've started this whole year that I'm continuing so far. Um, but 10 that were first in the series, three that were part way through a series, two were the companion books, and one that was last in a series. So I did finish one series. <laughs> finished one series this, this quarter. No, actually, because I haven't started a ton of series, and I finished quite a lot of series in March, um, because I haven't started a ton of series, I think I'm doing okay with my series totals. I would like to, really, I feel like I want to focus more on making progress in series and, like, finishing series. So I've got so many series on my series spreadsheet, and we'll probably talk about this more uh, in a video that's coming soon, but I've got so many that I've only read the first book. It's embarrassing. And I would like to read the second book of quite a lot of series and just figure out how interested I still am in them, you know? And then last stat, I will just show you this. We won't go through every single year, but this is the publication year of the books that I've read. So interesting that I had quite a few 2020s. The biggest year grouping is 2023, which is not surprising because I'm always not great at reading year, uh, books in the year they came out and I always read them the year after. But I did read six 2024 releases this quarter, but I read seven 2020. So 2020? Why am I reading 2020 books? What the fuck? Maybe it's TBR veterans? Yeah, I think that's maybe it. Like, quite a few of the TBR veterans probably came out around 2020. But yeah, and then they're just like random years. Like, I read a book from 1990. I read a book from 1813. I read a book from 2016, 2015, you know. But those are the biggest years. And that's normal, really. The biggest years are the ones uh, most recent, the five most recent years. So that is all of our stats. Let's get into the five best and five worst books I read this quarter. Okay, time for the best and worst. Shall we start with the worst? I feel like we should start with the worst. And we'll go from number five to number one because we'll end on a positive note. <laughs> so my fifth worst book this month is almost not fair because like, is it fair to judge this book alongside all the other books? But I am gonna say Unhinged by Vera Valentine. If you watched my video where I participated in the readathon that my patrons created, Bingathon, I read this cause they all read it. And um, you know, it's door smut. What the fuck is going on in here on this day? She, she fully loves, love is a strong word. <laughs> she fucks the door, you know? She fucks the door. And A, it's weird. Like when you read the first scene, you're like, oh, what the fuck is going on? Like, it's, I don't even know how to explain to you what you're reading. But then the more that I read, the more I said, if you're gonna do a door smut book, commit to the bit. It was so boring. It was so bo like if you're gonna do a door smut book, that like play on the puns, play on like come up with imaginative ways of this happening or things we're doing or like, you know, 
think of more analogies where like, oh, she's doing this, it means, you know, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to spell it out for you, but we could have done more. <laughs> I just felt like it was so boring. The writing was terrible, but like I said in the video, like, I don't know if this was ever for me. I'm a mainstream romance girly. I'm like the most, well, not the most mainstream, because the most mainstream is like Colleen Hoover and like, you know, I don't like that side, but I love my Ellie Hazelwoods, my Abby Jimenez, my Talia Hibberts, my Emily Henrys. Like, that's my little sphere of romance. I feel like my romance area is quite definable. I see all those authors as very similar to one another. So, yeah, I just don't think, like, I'm not in the subculture. This book was never going to be fun for me. <laughs> you know? I just don't think, like, it, A, it's weird. Like, you, you're reading something that your brain is going... How did a human come up with this? But then once you've acclimatized the idea of a human brain coming up with this, you're like, but, but, but you're not doing enough with it. <laughs> you're not giving me the drama enough. So yeah, it was like, listen, it's like 60 pages. It's, there's nothing really to say about it. It literally just door smart. Like that's what the whole book is, is her door and her, and you know, them falling in love, <laughs> if you can call it that. <laughs> the next book is another one where it just wasn't for me. These first two books, I can see them finding an audience who enjoys them. This is just another one that wasn't for me and it's gonna be Butter by Asako Yuzuki. This one we're following a journalist who is following the story of a woman who's accused of murdering these men, but also like cooking for them and like taking care of them. And there's an obsession with food and with you know, weight and diet culture, and it's set in Japan, and kind of is examining the feminine I, I, attitudes towards food in Japan, and I just found this very triggering. I said in that video, I have had issues around food before, and I've never, I don't think I've ever been triggered by a book. I don't think I've ever been triggered by a book. Like, it's just nothing I've ever experienced or had strong enough feelings about something to experience, but I think I did with this one. I found it just the way that it was describing food, very unsettling, and I didn't enjoy it. Also, it's way too long. It's like almost 500 pages and it drags. This could have been 250. I, I don't, I could not tell you, like if I told you the plot beat for beat, you'd be like, that's 250 pages worth of story. Like I don't, and it's not even like the writing is particularly beautiful or lyrical. It's just a lot of standing around talking and I just found it was so boring. <laughs> it was so boring. I haven't loved a ton of the Japanese thrillers I've read. I think I prefer the more like magical realism-y, contemporary, like that kind of side of Japanese translated fiction. The thrillers I've read, I just think the thriller conventions of the genre don't work for me. Number three, I cannot find. It's somewhere, it's somewhere behind here. But as we know, this these shelves are a mess. <laughs> It's hiding and I'm not about to tear the whole bookshelf to find it. But the third worst was A Spoonful of Murder, which is a cosy murder mystery where we're following, well, they say they're elderly women. They're not really. I think they're in like their 50s and they don't understand what emojis are. Girl, girl, get a grip. <laughs> Who are trying to solve the murder or the death that they think is a murder of one of their old colleagues. And this one, A, eh? these three women, could not tell you which one was which. I don't know her. Right. Like, what am I supposed to say? Like, there was one who was uh, self conscious about her weight, there was one who was worried about her grandson, and there was another one. And they were just so indistinguishable for me. I just read, by the end, I was reading them as one person. They were just one character. Because something also that was weird about this book is they weren't together a lot. They went off and did separate things. Like they'd have each have a scene where they were doing something else, and then they'd each have another scene where they were doing something else, and then they'd come together and talk about it, and like share what happened. And I just felt like that was very strange. Like I like, if it's a gang solving a murder mystery, I like them to be together on the journey. And I didn't feel like this was well. They didn't particularly like each other. <laughs> and um, you solve the murder very early on. You know what's happening very early on. I did not feel like this was well written. It, it stunk to me of a publisher wanting a Thursday murder club. Every publisher wants a Thursday murder club, right? They all want it. Don't, don't compare where you can't compete, babes. Don't compare where you can't compete. They all want one and this just, it wasn't ready. It wasn't ready to be published, in my opinion, this book. Like, I just feel like this author should have wrote a couple books behind the scenes. Like, so many authors, their first book is not their first book. You know, I feel like mine will be, because I'm just amazing. <laughs> I just think she's very delusional and maybe possibly insane. So many authors, they write a few books before the one that gets them published. And who knows, J.M. Hall might have done. But 
there was just something about this that I felt like you haven't quite worked out your writing style, you haven't quite worked out your writing craft and it felt a little bit yeah, unfinished. Okay, second worst I read this quarter. Apologies if I ever say this month, because that's what I'm used to saying, but it is this quarter. I don't know if I've said it yet. I've really been trying not to, but I may have done. Uh, second worst was Shine by Jessica Young. So Jessica is from, what band? Girls' Generation, I'm pretty sure. She was part of and then left and under drama. <laughs> there was tea. And this is like a YA contemporary romance of an, of a basic, it's basically autobiographical. Like when you look up Jessica's Wikipedia, it's kind of beat for beat. It's kind of beat for beat. The year of just realizing stuff and everyone around me were all just like realizing things. I did not enjoy this. I did, I just didn't enjoy it. The writing really was not good. And I felt like it was, it, it was stuck with what it wanted to do. I feel like she didn't want to truly upset the industry, but I feel like she wanted to tell her story of why what happened in her life happened without directly saying why what happened happened <laughs> but i feel like it's torn between a rock and a hard place of trying to critique the industry but being afraid to upset it does that make sense so like it's talking about these negative aspects but they're never it's kind of like oh that sucks oh it sucks we get weighed every day as like 12 year olds or like when we're trainees like it sucks we can't eat anything it sucks that they work us so hard it sucks that like we get pitted against each other in this super competitive environment but then have to like be put in a band with our people we've been in competition with and suddenly be friends with them it all sucks but you know <laughs> i just feel like it wasn't really successful in what it wanted to do the romance there was no <laughs> No chemistry there at all, babes. And it's it's another situation where it's half a book. I found like this with um Kendall and Kylie's book, <laughs> where they have an idea. I read that, that's a throwback. That was so long ago. That's like one of my first videos, really, Rebel City of Indra. But um when there's a subty book, there's like an idea, and then they go, you know what, we can make money off this. Let's split it in half and make it two books. You know, let's make it duology. But it means that the ending of this book is not really an ending of a book like it does not feel satisfying as a reader so yes 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 <laughs> and then my worst book of the quarter is one that's just incredibly offensive to me and it's the cat who caught a killer by lt shira i am sorry you're telling me you're telling me that a cat solving a murder mystery sorry i just like stabbed myself on my chin i hope you haven't taken all my chin makeup off is there an obvious mark? I don't know. <laughs> You're telling me that a cat solving a murder mystery, I hate it. It's beyond belief. It is just beyond belief. I'm sorry, that's just so personally offensive. That's like, <laughs> that's a sin. That's a sin where we've got this retired detective and a talking cat. Now, the, a, the talking cat didn't have a good energy to me. I always say The Travelling Cat Chronicles by Hira Arakawa is one of the best at having the cat voice. The cat voice. There's a cat voice. Cats talk in a certain way. This cat was, it wasn't a cat. He wasn't a cat. I didn't like the way he spoke. The cat narration, the cat narrative voice was deeply unsettling to me. He kept talking about people's auras and like how they glow and he can see the colors of people's auras. I'm sorry. He just was not, he just wasn't a little shit enough. Cats have to be a little bit of a little shit. And he was just a pompous, like, oh, I love you. Fuck off. Fuck off. I was angry. I was angry. Not enough little shit. Even Lux, you know, my cat, he's like, oh, I love my mom. He's like more pathetic about it. This cat was just like, <laughs> like, fun, like the, the greatest person you've ever met. Just so clever, so above it all, but caring for, no, cats are selfish little shits. And they're funny. It wasn't funny. <laughs> and it was just badly written. The author, you know, they were like, the main characters were like, members of the conservative association. Oh, just incredibly, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's one thing to vote, Tory. It's another thing to be a member of the local conservative association. And like the Labour, the Labour member who one of them knew was like, the was a villain a little bit. And I'm like, I'm just not sure about this author's politics. There was a few moments where the political opinions in this were, were sus. They were sus. 
you know? So anyways, that was my worst book of the quarter. Let's get into the best. Okie dokie, my fifth best book was a surprise and it was Reach for the Stars by Michael Craig. I mean, it might not be a surprise, but I really loved this. So this is non-fiction, it's spoken oral history following the history of British pop from 1996 to 2006. So we start with the Spice Girls and we have Five Steps, S Club Seven, uh, Sugar Babes, the Sugar Babes chapter is really good, Girls Aloud, The X Factor. This was amazing. If this is your era of pop, I cannot recommend reading this enough. It was just fascinating. The way that Michael Craig, because this is interesting, right? There's not a lot of parts where he wrote stuff, right? A lot of it is just the oral history from interviews he conducted from different people. But the way that he pieced this narrative together, I thought was so well done. The interviews, you know, it's a talent. It's just different talents than what we usually see in books. But I just thought this was a fascinating look into all these different bands and the journeys that they had. And a, lot them, a lot of them had similar journeys where they were like on the up, then they all got sick of each other, then they hated each other, and they, then they split up, you know. It's, <laughs> it's very similar. But I just found this absolutely fascinating. I love reading non-fiction about like niche subjects. <laughs> very specific niche subjects and I feel like this is a great example of that. I cannot recommend, this is obviously a niche part of my audience who are like British and from the right era but if you are, if you are, probably a little bit older than me, now I'm a little bit young, <laughs> I was like three years old, like don't stop moving. I don't know when that came out but probably around then. Yeah I cannot recommend picking this up enough. Sometimes it has, I've seen some deals on, on Kindle for the ebook um, I just thought it was great. I just thought it was so well done. Coming in at number four, we have Bookshops and Bone Dust by Travis Baldry. This is the prequel to Legends and Lattes. And in this one, Viv gets injured and so she has to recover in this little seaside town while her mercenary raiders, or whatever they're called, fighters, uh, go and fight on a little bit further and then they're back, gonna come back for her. So she's kind of recovering and she stumbles across this bookshop. And I just love... I love Travis Powdry. I say it again and again, no one does cozy fantasy like him. Not a joke, just a fact. I'm yet to find another author that gives me the feeling that Travis Baldry's books give me. Like, I thought when I read Legend Lattes, oh my god, I love cozy fantasy. <gasps> this is like my new favourite thing. And I've tried reading loads and they don't get it. <laughs> They don't do it like he does it. The closest I've come is Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. That's the closest I've come. But no one gets it like he does. Did I love this as much as those in lattes? No. Is it still amazing? Yes. It's still got that found family, that cosy, that quaintness, that comfortingness. I loved it. I also loved the, the epilogue to this. I, Travis Padre, what are you writing next? Please let me know. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, Travis Padre's books are just so gentle. And they're a hug and they're small and they're comforting and sometimes that's what you need sometimes you just need like comfort oh, <laughs> i just think he's so good at it so good at it i cannot wait to see who comes out with next and yeah i really enjoyed the the characters we met the relationships that we had in this book the more sides of viv's personality that we saw i really enjoyed so yeah Third best of the quarter, we have The Warm Hands of Ghosts by Catherine Arden. This is set in World War One, and we have two siblings. We have a soldier and a nurse who have been split up a little bit in the war. They're trying to find each other. She receives some of his clothing that suggests he may be dead, but there's also things missing that he would have that would have been put in there if he was dead and she goes to go find him. And there's also a big fantastical element to this because it's Catherine Arden. And this book is very, very unique. I think this is a very ambitious book. It's a very intense book. I keep saying it, it feels like a very grand book. There's certain books you meet, you meet where it feels like there was a lot put into them. Like I always say Babel is an example of that where they're just like, they're intense and not in terms of like, stressing you out or whatever there's just a lot of gravitas to the book the book has had so much poured into it does that make sense and i definitely feel like that with this book it was so interesting seeing Catherine Arden's writing differ because I, I feel like her writing often represents, or her storytelling represents the historical time period in which her books are set. The Brendan Nightingale is very lyrical, it's it's folklore it's it's based on Russian folk tales and the way the story unfolds is very reminiscent of that. The way this book reminisces is very more to the point writing and it's very much inspired by the stories that soldiers would tell each other in the war to get through it and just the way that she's able to morph these stories into kind of like embodiments of their time period I just think is amazing I don't want to say too much I feel like this is the kind of book you should just go into because I don't want to build your your expectations up too high because it's very I don't know how to describe it it's very small but it's very big <laughs> what did she say 
just talking shit. But I loved the sibling relationships that we had in this one. And I just always feel like I'm in safe hands with Catherine Arden. I know that she's gonna take care of me and that the book is gonna like, I don't really have to stress about like, oh, is there plot holes? Oh, is have I got a problem with this? Like I can just read it. I know she's got, she's got me. <laughs> she's got my back. Number two is Love Theoretically by Ali Hazelwood. <laughs> Now, in contrast to Warm House of Ghosts being so big and like intense and so much put into it, I mean like, and here's a word, she just, she just churns this shit out. She just goes, ah, blah, 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 blah. she sneezes and like a bug. <laughs> like this, is basically red Uh This is her release last year. I do actually have sitting right here, I just got my hands on Not In Love, which is her adult contemporary release this year. Yeah, this came out last year and we're following rival physicists. She's a fake data for hire. She's fake dating this guy's brother. Then she goes to interview at this job and he's like one of the senior members of faculty. And he's also this guy who wrote this awful article in the physics realm that made her part of physics seem stupid. And it's them. And I just, I mean, what is it? to say, right? Every Al Hazelwood book, basically the same thing. Basically the same tropes, basically the same format, basically the same story arc, and I eat it up every single time. I just love it. <laughs> Seriously, because, no, she's eating. She ate with that. Gobbled, cleared the plate. I love the way her characters act. I love the way that they interact. I love the kind of, often it also looks at like workplace culture within the science field, which I don't know anything about, but I eat up every single time. Like they're talking about, oh, as a grad student, like this, or like as a new person who's interviewing, I have to do, and I'm like, yeah, tell me about it. Like I feel like she infuses life stuff with, um, with the romance very, very well. I just love Ali. I just love her. I just love her. You know, she just doesn't remember, there's nothing to say. It's Nelly Hayes' word and I love it. <laughs> and my favorite book of the quarter and probably still my favorite book of the year is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. You actually haven't seen this yet because I, in this weekend's vlog, I got gifted this absolutely beautiful, like satin edition of Pride and Prejudice. I am, I think it's like one of my most favorite book possessions I've ever owned. It's got these gorgeous illustrations. I'll just show you a little flavor. You see a lot of it in this. Uh, weekend's vlog but um it's by the art is by bill donovan the first appointed artist in residence for christian dior and i just love the design of this anyways pride and prejudice by jane austen i feel like i've spoken about this a lot so we know how much i love it it was amazing rereading this i mean i read it when i was a child but <laughs> i know the story i feel like i'm rereading it because i watch the show all day every day <laughs> i don't know if i'm watching it while maybe i need to gonna rewatch of it. I love the story of Pride and Prejudice and I felt like I got so much more from reading this. Lizzie and her family are struggling. It's all daughters. So the mother wants to marry them off and Mr. Darcy comes to town. He's on a lot of money, but Lizzie meets him and he's like, he's prideful, baby. He's <laughs> full of pride. He's a bit up himself. Seems a little bit standoffish, awkward, says not very nice things. Um, and it's the story of, of them. And it's just so interesting when you know a story so well to actually read the book and just like, you know, I learned so much more about Lizzie, about her dad, about the dynamic, like you see, like I said before in the show, you're in Lizzie's perspective really. So you kind of don't see anything that she's doing is wrong, but she's the prejudice in this. And you see her prejudice in the book. And you see, I mean, Miss Darcy is obviously still a bit more of a little shit, but, <laughs> but you see some actions that Lizzie takes, or you see how her father has let the family down. And in the, in the show, you just really critique the mother for like her over the topness and, uh, and crassness in society. But you see why she's as de desperate as she is for these girls to be married because of what the father has done. And I just thought it was fascinating. Jane Austen is a funny, funny gal. I just imagine a world where Jane Austen had lived longer, younger, because she died very young. Imagine a world where we got more Jane Austens, but like, would it, would, would they have lasted this time if there was more of them? Is it so special because there's these few of them? But I am just loving every single Jane Austen I read. They're so funny. They're really looking at a lot of human nature elements as well, whilst following these rich ass people falling in love. Like there's a lot of underlying themes to them. And it's just such an enjoyable read. So I absolutely love Prime Prejudice and I'm so happy I now have this gorgeous, gorgeous edition that when I move and I have more bookshelves, you best believe it's gonna be face out, proud of place, cause I love it. So there we have it everyone. That was my quarterly wrap up for the months of April, May and June. Let me know what you thought of this new format. I really, really enjoyed it actually. I think this video is gonna be quite long though. <laughs> 
<laughs> so maybe a little bit longer than the monthly wrap ups, but I loved this. I thought it was so fun to chat about all of this with you. Let me know your quarter, your best, your worst. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing these wrap ups in this format. So thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you thought of any of these books that I mentioned as well. And I'll see you very soon in another video. Bye.